Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Patricio, for the for the introduction, and thank you also for having me. Uh, it's great to be talking about the. Uh, a big fraction of my work uh, here to all of you. Um, as Patricia said, like I've been working on learning intensity mapping, that is a novel probe of the um, to explore the universe and is sensitive both to astrophysics and cosmology. And it's going to be, um, I'm going to be basically motivating uh, how it works and uh, why I think it's very interesting and very complementary to other probes. And please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. I prefer it that way that then in the end, uh, all of them. Okay, so I guess that. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, since um, <clears throat> I'm come from the back, uh, background of cosmology, even if I say that the uh, line intensity mapping is uh, sensitive to both astrophysics and cosmology, and I'm going to explain that in a in a second. Uh, I'm more interested in the part of like the sensitivity to cosmology. I'm learning the part of astrophysics uh, as I learn more and more about learning intensity mapping. But like basically, this is like of our understanding of the evolution of the universe uh, since the epoch of recombination. That is when the first hydrogen uh, atoms form, and then after that, the photons uh, travel basically unaffected to, uh, to us. And uh, this is because before we had like uh, the the dark ages here, like uh, the universe is mostly uh, neutral, and the only way to access through to that information is through the emission of um, the spin flip emission of the 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen. And then in the cosmic down, the first stars form in the first collapse objects, and uh, the universe starts to reionize little by little in what we call cosmic down, and then reionization to go to the cosmic noon, that is basically the moment in which the star formation rate density of the universe peaks. And then after uh, we get to the epoch of the large scale structure and uh, now they dominated by, by dark energy. And here I, I'm expressing basically the scales in which the collapse of the structures becomes nonlinear. that um, it's important on larger and larger scales as we evolve uh, in the evolution of the universe uh, because uh, structures grow and grow more. Okay. Okay, perfect. So basically, uh, the way that we can probe fundamental physics uh, with cosmology basically is because um, what we do in cosmology in the end is study the background evolution, basically how the universe expands as a whole, and also the perturbations. We have seen that even if now we can see that the universe is um, very homogeneous uh, at large enough scales, and especially early on, the universe was very, very smooth. That's basically what we can see also from the CMB, where the perturbations are around 10 to the minus 5 um, in fraction with respect to the, to the mean. And that's why, basically, we can use linear perturbations to explore uh, the evolution of the universe. And this is because uh, the initial conditions that we take to understand the, the universe are given by inflation. We assume an inflationary model. And uh, from that, in every point of the universe, the initial conditions uh, will be a random draw from a distribution from which, for a given um, model, we will know that distribution. And basically, what we care about, because it's the thing that we can pre um, predict with most um, accuracy, is the variance which at the end of the day, we can think of the variance in a single point or the variance in two point statistics, which is uh, this power spectrum. It's basically, uh, the, here I'm working on Fourier um, space. You can think this as a different modes, a different um, scales and how uh, big each of these modes are for like, as with any, um, Fourier uh, transformation that you can think of. And at the end of the day, separating two points by a given scale, we can see how big that mode is, um, is excited or like how big in the growth of perturbations we see that mode. And that's basically what we see with the power spectrum. And here, basically, I'm showing how this power spectrum addressive zero is probed by different probes. Uh, this is like from the largest scale, we can get them from the CMB. These are all these Planck um, 
data points, and then at smaller scales, we uh, get that from Galaxy surveys, both from clustering and from lensing, but also from the from the Lyman Alpha Forest that allows us to get to uh, smaller and smaller scales. And uh, this is the way that we can probe uh, fundamental physics because we uh, get this to redshift zero to the present, even if these probes uh, are observations at different redshift around the cosmic history, because we can predict that evolution of the perturbations. We can use general relativity and the Boltzmann equations to study the evolution or the dependence of gravity on each independent um, species of the universe. You can think of these here like baryons, cold dark matter, neutrinos, so on. And that is a deterministic evolution. So we can't predict each specific state in a specific point because it depends from the random initial conditions. But statistically, we can predict it because we know the statistical, uh, or we can predict for a given model, the statistical conditions of the primordial universe and also how uh, those have evolved in a deterministic way. So since the mean of these perturbations by the vision is um, it vanishes, basically we get most of the information from the variance as function of scale, two-point statistics, or higher order description of the fields. Three-point statistics, uh, you can have here wavelet scattering transform, uh, any kind of description that can get uh, your field, your 3D map of the universe into some summary statistic that you can get. And basically, that's why. However, if you introduce here any new interaction, some deviation from general relativity on some new interaction between particles or some dark matter that is not cold and, and only interacts with uh, the rest of the particles with um, uh, gravity, basically you are modifying this deterministic evolution. And therefore, here, this power spectrum is going to be uh, different. This dash point here is the nonlinear power spectrum because this is the, the linear one that is the one that we can predict in a deterministic way. But imagine, for example, that you have actions that introduce uh, due to the, um, the quantic interaction that they, that they have, <coughs> introduce effectively some pressure in small scales. This you will see a suppression of the clustering at small scales because that pressure prevents uh, structures in very small scales to collapse. So basically, if we can probe these scales, we can uh, probe the um, dependence or the, the nature of the dark matter, and so on and so forth with different features in different parts of this power spectrum. The problem is that if this is our understanding of the universe, this is basically the moments that we have direct information from. We have very good uh, observations from the cosmic microwave background thanks to experiments like Planck, but then we don't have any direct proof of this evolution of the universe until we have uh, the maps from galaxy distributions and the cosmic CR from galaxies at low redshift from the galaxy surveys. And this all part of the universe, basically, we have some indirect um, impact on the CMB specifically, but basically it's what we use our models to evolve the perturbations. Okay, so... Uh, I hope that I have motivated uh, enough how things work in cosmology and like how we can probe fundamental physics with it. And uh, probably uh, you have already here, even if you are uh, still in your in your master, but like uh, probably even in the seminars of this of this course have said this uh, many times. We are in the epoch of uh, precision cosmology, and this is thanks to all the effort, both in theory and experiments, um, to develop very. Uh, precise measurements and accurate predictions for the CMB, the clustering of galaxies and the BAO, galaxy lensing, supernovae, very recently also gravitational waves that are probably very good to uh, um, probe the expansion of the universe, but so far have been a certain probe of uh, modified gravity. And that has uh, helped us to establish the standard cosmological model, which is based on general relativity and is called lambda cold dark matter because we have some dark energy described by a cosmological constant, lambda, and the description of that we use for the dark matter is a cold dark matter that only interacts through gravity with the, with the rest of the species in the universe. This provides an excellent reproduction of most of the data, but it has some problems. First, on the phenomenological side or the theoretical side, uh, this is an anti unsatisfactory model because uh, both uh, the dark energy and the cold dark matter are phenomenological descriptions. It does not provide any um, information about its nature. 
But also uh, on the experimental side, it has the problem that uh, there are uh, some uh, persistent tensions between different probes. Uh, it tends to be between probes that probe the early universe and the late universe, both on the Hubble constant and on the clustering of um, structures at different scales. So I'm not going to focus so much on this, but if you're interested, I also have work, especially on the case of the Hubble constant, so we can talk about it later. Um, also, more from the astrophysical side, um, we have uh, still uh, limited information because we have limited uh, observations from the um, status and the um, what uh, raised and drives the formation and evolution of the first stars, the drivers of reionization, galaxy evolution, so on. There has been excellent work on these sites, but there's still a lot that we can learn about it and the, also the synergies with uh, cosmology. And in my opinion, the best way to tackle these problems that we have now in cosmology and astrophysics, we can come from three different uh, paths of research. One hand, we can improve the current set of, info of uh, observations that we have now. We can develop a better me measurements of the CMB, for example, or galaxy surveys. There are many people working already on this. From the theoretical side, we can develop new models to try to uh, see if like, we can solve the tensions of, uh, we that we have in lambda colder matter. But I'm going to focus now uh, today on the development of new uh, cosmological probes or observables that are complementary to the ones that we have. And this is very important, not only because this way we can reach new regimes that are in, inaccessible to the observations that we have right now, but also we can get um, independent information about the observations that we have right now. This is going to be very important, not only to break the analysis between the cosmological parameters and different um, information that we have, but also to check for systematics and so on. Okay, and uh, I'm going to be focused as a, in line intensity mapping. As I said before, I'm going to start saying first, what is line intensity mapping, the potential and opportunities that this cosmological probe has, how can we optimize the information return, and then there is no free lunch. There's also a lot of observational theoretical challenges, and if I have time, I can discuss some novel science cases that the intrinsic uh, nature of line intensity mapping open the door to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what is line intensity mapping? Uh, it's basically the combination of two different concepts. On one hand, we have intensity mapping that um, uses all the information that comes to the telescope. You get the telescope point somewhere and uses all the integrated signal and flags that it gets without requiring any detection threshold that is more common for galaxy surveys. Galaxy surveys work that you have some noise, you measure, a, you point your telescope in one direction, and basically the galaxy is going to be very bright, it's going to be above your noise by, let's say, five sigma, eight sigma, whatever um, detection threshold you want to put, and you point that point in your catalog. And then with that catalog, you study all the distribution that you have. Here, we don't do that. We basically use all the information that we have, and that has the problem that takes all the, uh, has the benefit that takes all the galaxies and intergalactic medium along the line of sight. So that's very good because it gets the faint galaxies, but it has the problem that it gets also all the contaminants that you uh, remove from your galaxy catalog. And the part of the line here is because instead of uh, getting just or focusing in all the information that it gets, that could basically give us some projected and two-dimensional map because we wouldn't have any information about where that radiation comes from. Line intensity mapping targets identifiable spectral lines. Basically, by tuning then the frequency of our detectors, we get we know the redshift that that radiation comes from and allows us to build three-dimensional maps. And basically, this is what you can expect from a couple of examples uh, of real and simulated um, emission from, from galaxies, this would be all the continuum emission, but we will be targeting all these lines that are bright over this uh, continuum emission, and through some uh, techniques and like the spectrographs, I'm not expert in map making or like the more observational part, so don't ask me many questions about this. Basically, we can remove all, uh, we can disentangle the emission from the lines from the continuum and get that three-dimensional map. That this is basically what we get. Here is a show of the mean line brightness temperature, which is another proxy from the intensity of each line at the end of the day, and uh, basically where the, the line emission comes from and the observed frequency. And you can see that we can basically pinpoint for each line the frequency uh, and the frequency that it comes, the, the residue that it gets. 
Okay, so let me give an example of how this works for cosmology with respect to a galaxy survey. This is basically all the galaxies that we would have at Resi 5 in a, a patch of like one square degree of the, of the universe and a slice of 0.2. And this is basically all those points. If we get some uh, theoretically, you can think that is more or less motivated that threshold to basically have a proxy of which of those galaxies um, will be detected, this will be the one. So basically all the regions of information that we have here about all this distribution get subsampled to only these points. And this is very problematic for cosmology at some point because having uh, not enough points, um, because galaxies become at some point very few and very faint in order to be used for cosmology because we need uh, many to do all the summary statistics that we need. However, by doing the techniques that I said before for line intensity mapping, these are the maps that we will recover. And this could be for some experiment like CO and this for C2. This is only the signal, not the contaminants. But you can see how we recover some of this structure, even if with worse um, angular resolution about, uh, of all the field. And not only that, but here we also get the information about how uh, each of these galaxies that we can't resolve because we are not interested in for line intensity mapping, how bright they are on each of these lines. And that is why um, line intensity mapping is sensitive to, is sensitive to astrophysics. So basically, <clears throat> Uh, as a rule of thumb, intensity fluctuations trace both of the at both side at both times uh, the matter density fluctuations because this distribution at large scales corresponds to the distribution of galaxies that in turn is a, a trace um, a, a bias tracer of the matter density, but also depends on the line luminosity of each of these of these galaxies. So for cosmology, you can think it as a noisy map of all galaxies and the intergalactic medium. Um, to be complementary to a very detailed map of the brightest points. And for astrophysics, it, it returns the aggregate of all emitters and the diffuse emission, while um, from luminosity functions, you can only probe a very um, a specific population of the galaxies. Uh, okay. <laughs> and the three main features that line intensity mapping is uh, unique to, basically is because what I was saying, right, is like it can it lets you to capture the faint and diffuse sources that you can't uh, measure any other way. It gives you access uh, beyond the reach of the galaxy surveys because it doesn't have that um, a strong cutoff on on Resit as galaxy surveys has because it's going to be mapping all the distribution and not um, be sensitive to only those right galaxies that at some point are not enough for for cosmology. And since we you can see it in this map. Since we don't require the detection of individual galaxies, we don't require that good angular resolution, and we can have these rough maps, we can very quickly and cheaply map three-dimensional uh, volumes of the universe because we can get low aperture telescopes that are much cheaper than the optical telescopes that are used for uh, galaxy surveys that require that good angular resolution and point them very quickly on the sky. So these surveys are much cheaper than the ones of um, for galaxy surveys. And with much cheaper, I'm talking of one or two orders of magnitude in the morning that it requires to, to do them. <clears throat> OK. I was saying, I'm not going to get uh, very deep on this, that with line intensity mapping, you can probe galaxy evolution. And uh, this is very interesting on the part that is also a very multi-tracer uh, technique, right? You can do line intensity mapping of any of these lines but you can do it on the same volume. So you can probe the same space in CO, for example, which is um, <coughs> a proxy for the molecular gas that you have in the, in the galaxy and how much this is excited from the radiation, uh, with the radiation of stars. And let's say Lyman alpha that gives you a proxy also of like how uh, the gas around the galaxy is excited from the radiation of stars and AGNs, but it probes the distribution of the neutral hydrogen rather than the molecular gas. And that basically gives you, first of all, if you can resolve it, the mapping of the galaxies, but also on more um, statistical ways, it allows you to probe how galaxies evolve uh, statistically. And you can uh, develop this with uh, conditional luminosity uh, functions on like basically given the properties of a galaxy, how bright it is in each of these, on each of these lines. So all these lines are usually related to the star formation rate because it's basically how different parts of the gas is, um, is excited by this uh, 
radiation. <coughs> Uh, and some of them, for example, H alpha is a very direct tracer of the star formation rate. Um, and it's the star formation rate basically because uh, the brightest guy, uh, stars are the ones that are very massive and very young, and those are very short lived. And basically, that's why it depends always on the star formation rate rather than on the star content of the galaxies. Uh, and then we have uh, 21 centimeter lines from. Um, from the spin fleet of the of the high, neutral hydrogen, that is very different from this because uh, the physics that um, triggers the signal is very different. This one, uh, it's coupled to some of the radiation, especially the radiation of Lyman alpha and the collision excitations of hydrogen, but it probes, it allows you to get to a much higher redshift than this because it doesn't require on uh, that excitation from stars. So theoretically, even you could even probe the dark ages, as I was saying before, if you could have those observations from the ground. Okay, so now let's go into uh, discuss some of the questions that I said before. This I already think I motivated enough. Intensity mapping leaves no photon behind, but this is a quantitative uh, example of that. This is a luminosity function from different observations, a very hard cutoff um, <clears throat> in the flux limit of different galaxy surveys. And basically you can see how here there is no point whatsoever, because these uh, luminosities are too faint for um, galaxies to be detected individually and, and resolved. And therefore, we don't know this end of the galaxy uh, of the luminosity function. This is very interesting for the um, uh, astrophysical community, because basically this gives you a lot of information of the galaxy evolution of a population that you can't prove otherwise. But for cosmology, it's also very interesting because usually these are a population of halos, of dark matter halos, that are uh, very different from the ones that you probe on galaxy surveys. So this uh, gives you an information of how the matter is distributed in different ways, but also can give you the probe of um, those very small uh, halos that are collapsed that, for example, with actions, you wouldn't see that, right? So this is a luminosity function. Uh, if you don't have very small halos with, that are very faint, because of actions, this probably would go like this, right? Rather than go up here. On the contrary, with uh, intensity mapping, this is a forecast for the survey time. Um, you would be able to probe the luminosity function to match uh, lower luminosities. Right now, we are on the stage of being uh, limited by very small experiments because we are in a pathfinder stage, but we will be able to reach uh, with future generation experiments very good measurements of the luminosity function. Okay, this plot I saw you be uh, before basically is motivating what I told you that with land intensity mapping, we will be able to probe directly in cosmological scales, much higher redshift, and this is very interesting, especially uh, even if I'm not going to discuss it very much because I don't have today, time today is the, the one of cosmic down that is very sensitive to especially dark matter properties. This is basically because um, <laughs> I told you before, cosmic down is uh, very sensitive to the radiation from the first stars that start to heat and ionize the neutral hydrogen at the very high redshift universe. And the formation of those first stars is very sensitive to the formation of the first collapse objects. So if you have any dark matter model that prevents that uh, formation of the first collapse objects or that delay it, the signal in the, in, around cosmic down and reionization is going to change a lot. And right now, experiments like HIRA are putting a lot of effort to get the measurements of on these ridges, on, on these redshifts. And the forecast is that the information that we will be able to get about this for models like axions or dark matter, uh, militar dark matter that scatter, uh, scatters with variants very, very faintly is very powerful and very complementary to the constraints that we have from the, from the CMB. Okay, uh, this is what I was saying before. So right now, the information that we have from galaxy surveys, it stops around receive 2.5 or 3. And we will be able to probe all this with a plethora of experiments that many of those are already taking data. Those are the solid lines in different lines, especially in the submillimeter as CO map or concerto or head decks. <clears throat> but many of these are also very interesting because these are very cheap experiments with very small teams that if they actually perform as they are expected, 
they are going to motivate a very big um, investment of this science and improvement. So we will be able to get to much larger uh, patches in the sky, uh, and that will allow to probe higher and higher, uh, larger and larger scales. So better for cosmology because we will have better statistics for that, and also larger, uh, higher and higher red seeds to probe also new regimes. Uh, here is also important to um, emphasize. If you can see here, all these lines that are related with the star formation rate are uh, most of them uh, with plant experiments and uh, very small patches of the sky in contrast to all these in 21 centimeter that are much larger uh, volumes, but also Mirkat and Hira are already observing. And this is basically some historical uh, <clears throat> explanation for this. The interest on line intensity mapping for these lines is very recent. The first papers written about this, I think, uh, especially from a cosmological point of view, or at least synergizing both uh, point of view, are very like from like 10, 15 years ago. So these are actually the first experiments that we have for this. Well, 21 centimeters, especially at low red and for astrophysics, has been developed from a lot of time, and the theory is very well established. So that's why there's right now more money for these experiments, and some of them are like really, really big experiments as SKA, while we are still building the expertise to deal with all of these uh, lines. Okay, so <clears throat> I hope that I have motivated enough why line intensity mapping is interesting and how it can contribute to the main questions that we have in cosmology and astrophysics. Now let's think about how we can use the actual maps that we recovered for cosmology. So you can imagine now, especially for single dish experiments, that we have maps of the intensity in each point of a 3D volume, right? <clears throat> uh, as I said before, we can't directly go and say, okay, I can see how is intensity in this point and get information from that. We need to do the summary statistic or the summary study of that, um, of that volume. And the way that we do that in a... <clears throat> In the simplest way for cosmology, or the thing that we are more used to is compute the power spectrum of the of that um, of that map, which is basically, as I was saying before, the variance of the perturbations at different scales. We can get the perturbation in the brightness temperature of the map, and it's going to be related with the matter uh, distribution. Uh, you have some bias because uh, the radiation comes from the tracer bias from the galaxies of the matter distribution. And then, since the intensity that you measure is not a number count density, as with galaxy surveys, but a density, uh, sorry, a fluctuation in the intensity of the map or the brightness temperature, also the amplitude of your perturbations is going to depend on the mean temperature of your map. Then the power spectrum, which is this variance, depends on the matter power spectrum, the, this bias term that you need to account for. Here is the uh, astrophysical dependence. And finally, some short noise, because you are measuring basically radiation from discrete counts on your map. <clears throat> and this is what I said in the, in the end, like if you care for cosmology, you want to focus on this matter power spectrum. If you care for astrophysics, you focus on this and this, basically because the luminosity for each galaxy is going to depend on the mass of the, of the galaxy, but also on some other problems. And basically, this gets us to some of the questions that I said before. If you remember that luminosity function that uh, and the faint emitters, it's interesting to see what kind of halos we can measure with line intensity mapping. And this is what uh, we tried to saw this um, with this study with some simulations in which we have here the histogram of the intensities in our volume, in our simulated map. And basically, we take the uh, faintest voxels compared with the brightest voxels, and we compare them here as what are the halos that we are having. As you can see here, that the faintest voxels statistically probe lighter and lighter halos, while we can go to the more massive halos in the brightest um, voxels of our map. A voxel is a 3D pixel, uh, which is basically the cell that we can divide our map in order to, to analyze it. And um, the problem here is that, of course, to access the faintest voxels is going to be much more complicated because they are going to be the more contaminated by um, foregrounds or by uh, noise and so on. 
So we need to develop different strategies to be able to access that information. And this kind of tools with simulations allows us to uh, perform that study. So I was saying before, the power spectrum. With the power spectrum, you can access all these quantities. And here I'm showing how uh, it depends on some of the um, on some of the quantities. Here I'm showing specifically how it depends on the scatter of the star formation rate with the properties of the galaxy. And you can see that both the amplitude, but also the shape at low uh, at the small scales, changes with that. And this is basically because both the clustering part changes with that factor on the dependence of the intensity of each galaxy with respect to the matter distribution, but also the soft noise changes. But here, if you focus more on cosmology, it's more interesting these wiggles here that are uh, the baryon acoustic oscillations that come from the CMB. Probably you have seen already maps of the CMB. I don't have here a plot, but like basically you can see the BAO feature. And that's basically be, uh, due to the <coughs> uh, sound wave of the baryon and the, and the dark matter uh, before recombination. And that gets frozen on the distribution of the large scale structure. So basically, we can predict very well what is uh, the acoustic wave that gives rise to this BAO and use it as a standard ruler of the universe and use it to measure distances. This is very um, robust and very established in galaxy surveys. Now we can extend it to much higher red six. So for example, here. <clears throat> uh, with this, we, can, we will be able to measure the angular diameter distance and the Hubble parameter to very high red six and probe dark energy or the evolution of the background of the universe in that um, whole range of the evolution of the universe that I mentioned before doesn't have any prior um, direct observations. So here we have the actual uh, constraints on both the angular diameter distance and the Hubble parameter at different redshifts. In purple, you have the measurements from both and EVOS. And in orange, you have the forecast for DESI, that is basically the biggest galaxy survey that is taking measurements right now and is actually working better than expected. It's quite impressive, but it's going to have this hard cutoff at high redshift, right? And what's going on here? Like, uh, this is like as we expect for a matter-dominated universe or we have some weird features here. This is going to be able to be probed with um, the even this current generation of experiments, hopefully, but definitely with the next generation of um, line intensity mapping experiments since we will be able to probe clustering of matter at this high redshift and basically probe whether uh, this is actually matter dominated or there's some uh, new physics driving the expansion history of the universe at this high redshift. And this is going to be critical to things like the, um, the Hubble constant tension. The Hubble constant tension is basically how the universe expands and uh, the measurements that we have right now from very high redshift from the CMB if we assume lambda CDM to understand and interpret those measurements, predict that um, the universe right now is uh, expanding at a much lower rate than what we measure directly with uh, local measurements. And basically, this tension that is around four or five sigma already will be able, <coughs> is sensitive to the whole evolution of the universe. So basically, if we find something here, that can explain that tension that we observe right now. We can also go to probe very large volumes because we are going to be able to access a very large patches of the universe at very high redshifts. And basically, you have a light cone. The farther you observe in distance, the same um, angle that you get is going to be sensitive to larger and larger volumes. And this is very interesting because in the largest scales uh, is where general relativity actually have some relativistic effects in the clustering of objects in redshift space but also we could be able to uh, access modes that uh, have been basically evolving uh, unaffected by the context of the universe um, from the initial condition. So we can also probe um, inflation. And some of the ways to probe inflation is probing the primordial non gaussianity on the um, measurements that we have. So basically this introduces some uh, dependence in bias tracers at very large redshift. And <clears throat> this is basically because some of these, due to this primordial non-Gaussianity that is affecting how the um, primordial fluctuations are distributed on the, on the sky in the very early universe, 
have some impact on the collapse of the more massive objects, right? So this is going to affect the clustering, but it's also going to affect the astrophysics because we are going to have more and more objects that are very massive and are expected to be also bright. Uh, so there is, this is also one of the main science drivers for primordial long Gaussianity, sorry, for line intensity mapping, but this is going to be limited and uh, very challenging due to systematic and foregrounds. And basically, right now, we are all working on trying to improve uh, the methodology to be more robust uh, against this. Okay, the problem with this is that, as you probably can imagine, the power spectrum is a very limited uh, tool to analyze these maps. And this is basically because line intensity maps are very non-Gaussian, and the power spectrum only gives you information about the Gaussian part of your field. And these are very non-Gaussian because not only uh, we have the non-Gaussianity from the gravitational collapse in the non-linearities, but also uh, the actual fluctuations that we measure in our map are dependent on the astrophysical processes that trigger the line emissions. So we have another layer of non-Gaussianity that basically makes that information that we have in the power spectrum, even if very robust and very easy for us to predict theoretically, is limited, and there's a lot of information that we are leaving beyond that. Also for astrophysics, the power spectrum only depends on the first and the second moment of the luminosity function. And uh, <clears throat> if we want to get some more information about astrophysics, we want to have all that information out, out, like the whole luminosity function. So in order to do that, we can work with different summary statistics, as can be the voxel intensity distribution. That is basically an estimator for the whole probability distribution function of intensities in our map. And this encodes the full luminosity function. And the estimator is very simple because it's just a histogram of your map. Basically, it looks like this when you compare it with noise, uh, uh, with noise but like if you ignore the noise at first, you can see here how the uh, dependence on some of the astrophysics is much larger than in the case of the... Um, than in the case of the power spectrum, especially here is what we are going to have information from in the very bright uh, end of your, of your luminosity, uh, sorry, of your temperature distribution, we can get, uh, get to that. And this gets all the information from the luminosity function because um, if we have very, very good angular resolution, this is actually some perfect galaxy survey with a noise, and we will be getting basically the PDF of the temperatures for boxes that contain one galaxy, but we don't have that very good angular resolution, right? So it, each of our boxes is going to contain more than one um, emitter, and uh, the PDF of the sum of two contributions is the convolution of the individual PDFs. The PDF of a given temperature given <coughs> uh, n emitters is going to be the PDF of by basically is going to be the convolution n times of that PDF. And that's why we can predict the whole probability distribution function of our map. Uh, again, we can provide a rule of thumb for this. The power spectrum is going to be best for cosmology, very limited for astrophysics, but it's very complementary with the BAD, which is more limited for uh, cosmology because it depends on the integrals of clustering, but it's going to contain a lot of information for astrophysics. How much time? I, I'm not tracking the time. Okay, okay, good. So we can combine them, of course, taking into account the whole covariance of, of that. And this is some simulated study of that. And for astrophysics, we can see how here, once we probe the luminosity function with a different combination of probes, this is only with the power spectrum. This is with the power spectrum and the, sorry, this is with the BID. This is with a combination of two. And if we compare the fractional errors of the luminosity function, we can see that we are improving quite a lot. In some cases, even like <coughs> a, almost half an order of magnitude in the sensitivity that we have for the luminosity function. And here for the bright end, we are uh, like even more than one uh, order of magnitude better. Of course, as I said before, this requires some um, understanding of the covariance between these two, that basically is the covariance between a two-point statistic, the power spectrum, and a one-point statistic, the BAD. So it's going to depend on the bias spectrum, which is a three-point statistic, but we can actually now 
uh, derive this analytically. And we see that for the current stage, um, sorry, for the final stage of the current generation of experiments, this is going to be very impactful because uh, the correlation between the two summary statistics is going to be very important. And we need to take that into account if we want to get robust and important measurements um, and conclusions from this. Now, this is a bit boring because it's very um, uh, technical, but this is what we can get to get very important information about. For example, as I said before, the some models of dark matter that is not the standard vanilla called dark matter produce, produce this cutoff on the power spectrum at small scales due to the interactions preventing clustering at those scales. And basically, we can model that phenomenologically with some cutoff from the standard power spectrum that we have here. And this is what we did. And this is going to produce some change in the halo mass function of our maps, sorry, of our universe, basically because since dark matter interacts in small scales, very small halos are not going to collapse because the clustering at those scales is going to be very, very small. So if we compare with lambda CDM here in black around one, the a halo mass function as function of the mass of the dark matter halo for different cases of this cutoff, we see this reduction of all the, the cases at a, a small, um, at a small uh, masses. And this is going to be very important for our line intensity mapping observables because since we get all the information from all those galaxies, we are going to be missing these halos and the mission of these galaxies so we can predict different uh, results in our power spectrum and BID. From the power spectrum, we get these constraints, these forecasted constraints. This is for spherics. In um, <coughs> the spectral index of this cutoff and the scale of this cutoff, and from the power spectrum, basically, we are very sensitive to the cutoff that we have, but not so much to the, um, to the spectral index. And this is basically because we are going to be sensitive in which now when we have the, the, um, the change in the actual matter power spectrum that we were measuring and we are sensitive to with the power spectrum of the intensity mapping, but <clears throat> the impact that we are going to have at a, in the contribution of all those galaxies to the map and the BID, sorry, to the map, is only accessible through the BID. And that's why we have this different degeneracy here with the BID. And with a combination of both, we are going to be able to get very good constraints on this, on this probe. And this is basically an example of how this combination of probes can also be very important for cosmology. Okay, now let's go to the bad news part of the talk. I was saying that basically intensity maps are uh, wonderful and get all the information that you can get, but the problem is that they also get all the contaminants and why yeah both on the observational part, but also on the theoretical part and the development of all the methodology to deal with this is very challenging. And basically because first of all, we have some continuous foregrounds. We, I, I saw you before the, the, the spectra from galaxies and there were the lines, but there's also the mission of the continuum of those galaxies. And basically that could be the correlated um, <coughs> continuous foreground. It's like the cosmic infrared background, uh, we have also some blurring and like a spectral index, uh, sorry, in the spectral resolution that blurs the information on the line of sight. We need to deal with um, <clears throat> this. And in order to clean the maps from these contributions, we lose the uh, contributions of our maps from the long line side of modes. And basically, in order to deal with, this, um, with these problems that are also, are, these are more problematic, but also a very important are the correlated uh, foregrounds that are basically the contribution from our galaxy. This is the worst for 21 centimeters, but not that bad for higher frequencies because the 21 centimeter is very clean. Then later for the astrophysical signal, we can either combine it with galaxy surveys. This will provide a very robust observations and the first uh, detections of line intensity in cosmological scales come from this cross correlation of galaxies. This basically comes from the fact that the galaxies are not correlated with the continuum foreground. So when we do the, co the um, correlation of galaxy surveys and our line intensity maps, we remove the contamination for the foregrounds. But this, uh, of course, is like limit us to the volumes that we also have information from galaxy surveys. So 
this is uh, also some kind of show stopper for us. And then there are some other ways to deal with this, with like neural networks in order to model this, um, this contamination and some other more um, <clears throat> developed actually uh, tools like PCAs, linear component analysis, and so on and so forth. But also for the high frequency lines, uh, line interlopers are a problem. And what are line interlopers? Basically, are a emission from different redshifts that redshift into the same um, frequency. Uh, basically, this is the plot that I showed you before. If we measure, let's say, at 100 gigahertz, we are targeting CO to one, for example, for very low redshifts. But the problem is that here we are picking this, 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 we are picking all this signal, all comes from very different redshifts. And we need to also develop uh, ways to deal with this. We can, of course, the more problematic ones are the ones that come from lower redshifts because it's the um, brightest emission. And in order to deal with that, we can uh, either mask those uh, brightest voxels. Uh, this will be the blind masking. Um, or use external data to um, do some targeted masking and mask the voxels that we know that that contribution are coming from. Imagine we have we are targeting line intensity mapping at very high redshift, and we have some foreground from redshift that we also have galaxy distribution. So we know that when those galaxies are located in that map, we can expect a very bright emission for the program. So we can basically mask that voxel because we know at which frequency and position on the sky in corresponds in our map from our intensities. And at the end of the day, clean most of this uh, <clears throat> contamination for foregrounds in our maps. And also we can actually model the, the contributions of these interlopers and perform the whole analysis, taking into account the fact that we are receiving information from many redshifts. We can do this basically modeling uh, the effect uh, or the projection effects of Trans, uh, transforming those angular uh, scales to three-dimensional scales in the end. And basically, <clears throat> with this, we will be able to get also more information in cosmology and astrophysics because we have more signals, but they can also be somewhat they generate. So it's also, it, it has also some trade-off. This is basically the effect of these, of these foregrounds from some simulations we have here some simulated map of only C2 at C5. And this is also including all the rotational lines from CO that will affect this map. And as you can see, it changes a lot, the map. Uh, and not only the map, but also the summary statistics. Here I'm showing the power spectrum and the VAD. And the one that is only C2 would be here in this uh, blue line and this one. and adding all the contributions would be the black line. And as you can see, it's, uh, it, can be, it can get very complicated to deal with this. The good thing is that if we have some coherent model for all this emission, we already have it for cosmology. So if we have it for astrophysics, we can model of this with a single model and actually have a lot of information. Okay. Um, I'm going to run, what do we have, like five minutes? I'm going to run a bit uh, quickly about some um, science case that is intrinsic from intensity mapping. And I think that is very interesting. And it's the case that we can actually probe uh, also with this kind of concept of the line interloper, the effect of exotic uh, relative decays. And what do I mean with exotic relative decays? Basically, dark matter, the model that we have for it is that it's cold, but some models also include some connection with photons that actually you have one particle of dark matter decaying into two photons. This would be, for example, the action. Action and action like particles include this coupling with photons. And it's the same that uh, for um, <clears throat> lighter actions uh, produce the oscillations between actions and photons on the presence of uh, magnetic fields, uh, that coupling also uh, produces the decay of, of these into two photons. And we know that that actually produces an emission line because since this is like a one to two decay, the, um, due to the conservation of energy and momentum, the energy of those photons is actually half of the mass of the action. So we have an action and it decays, that produces a line. The same we can have it with neutrinos. Neutrinos also 
um, the standard model considers the coupling between the different uh, species of the of the neutrinos and um, the, the the constraints are like the prediction for that coupling is very very small for the decay in a standard model, but beyond the standard model there is some probability that there could happen. So if we can see some decay or exotic decays from the those neutrinos between the standard neutrinos, it will be a smoking gun for um, beyond the standard model science. Okay, and basically, since we have that that um, that line, we can probe the residue that this come from, and it will happen in our observations for free to appear as a line interloper of a frequency that we are not expecting any information from. So if we can look for that contribution at this specific frequency, if it does not coincide with the contributions from the lines that are targeting by these experiments, we can get some information. Uh, sorry, this is the case of the of the neutrinos. In this case, the contribution, uh, since we don't know the individual masses of the of the neutrinos, it depends on the sum of the neutrino masses and the actual hierarchy and the decay between the stages of, uh, different states of the neutrinos that is that is happening. Okay. And basically, uh, what was surprising is that this is actually for some idealized forecasts, very competitive, especially around the uh, actions that are around the electron volt energies. This is corresponding to near infrared and especially optical frequencies, uh, because these are actually very, very hard to probe uh, for regular actions with other with other experiments, either like direct detection or haloscopes or other astrophysical probes. So while for some millimeter this is actually not that um, competitive, and we are only going to have this kind of range here that overlaps with uh, the the constraints from globular clusters and haloscopes and so on. This probe is going to be uh, very important, and actually, there's we can talk about this later if you want. There's a lot of interest in this range right now because of the recent uh, four sigma excess in the cosmic optical background that have been measured by the New Horizons probe. Uh, okay, for the neutrino decay, we have something similar, and uh, we actually have very good um, and competitive constraints with respect to um, CMB spectral distortions and forecasts right now, and are competitive the forecasts that we have with actual constraints from the Boroxino experiment at the tip of the red giant branch. But it's important also to emphasize that in this case the nature of the neutrinos that we are probing is very different because this could be <coughs> stellar neutrinos and solar neutrinos, but we will be probing cosmological neutrinos. So it's also very complementary in the origin of the signal that we come, that we can get from. So basically, and already started with the conclusion that we have, uh, the situation that we have now on intensity mapping is very interesting because uh, we have we have been developing all these uh, experiments and all this theory, both to deal with the signal and to develop the tools to analyze the signal and get uh, robust conclusions from it. And right now, there's a lot of experiments that are going to be observing uh, in no time. Also, again, for taking the first steps with lots of overlap with galaxy surveys in order to get those first uh, observations. I'm part of two of them. I'm part of Hedex. I'm part of Birkat that observes in 21 centimeters. I'm also working a lot on the theory to many of these um, science cases, pro more from the phenomenology and the theory side, and also in the development of these tools. But <clears throat> basically, we have, thanks to line intensity mapping, a new way to access all this information, plus correlated with galaxies and the, the shear, and also with the CMB secondaries. So even if we have some challenges, we have also some uh, reasons to be optimistic. The biggest challenge is basically is the astrophysical uncertainties in the signal for cosmology. We need to marginalize overall that signal and we need to do it in a way that is robust. We need to take into account many things. And here, since line intensity mapping is in the middle point between two different communities, um, the more astrophysical and the more cosmological one, uh, we need to be very active in this crosstalk, basically to know what are the main challenges in both. Because, for example, historically, cosmologists have ignored this astrophysical uncertainty, but uh, the more astrophysical community working on this have ignored all the uncertainties and the problems of nonlinear clustering, right? So, like, we are now at that point. 
Um, and like, at least for me, this is, has been very fun because I'm learning a lot of astrophysics. Also, we need a, a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of control over basically the other contaminants and the, the foregrounds and interlopers. This, in the worst case, can bias our conclusions. And on the least worst case, but also very limiting, is going to produce some loss of information. So we need to develop uh, tools to do this in an optimal way and be able to reconstruct that loss of information. And also, so we, we have some things that we need to deal with once we get the very good measurements that we expect that we will be able to have, such as, for example, the line broadening of the, of the mission. Like the gas is not there like a stop, right? Gas is orbiting our own galaxies, and that's going to produce all that uh, broadening in the line that we, that we observe. However, as I said, we have reasons to be optimistic. We are like basically uh, seeing by a small community, but like a lot of efforts, both on the experimental and the theoretical side to improve the pipeline. We can develop other summary statistics to deal with these observational challenges better. And even at the very least, if we are able to measure the BAO, this will be a very clean measurement addressive that we don't have access to with galaxy surveys. And we are open to many, many um, new no, uh, science cases, such as like this exotic decays that I mentioned, or the actions, or any dark matter model that you consider, or the primordial non-Gaussianity, and so on. This is like this is great because it's not only the things that you can do with galaxy surveys at different stages, but the particularities of line intensity mapping opens you a lot of opportunities. And finally, we have all this cross check through cross correlations, not only with galaxies, but also with the CMB and line intensity map. So yeah. I mean, these are like some of the conclusions that I, that I have, but I think that I've already been talking about this and it's more interesting if you ask me and we start having a conversation about this. So, thank you for listening. Um, so the BID, basically, um, let me, so here, for example, the BID is going to be the awaited sum of convolutions of your luminosity function. Your luminosity function is going to be dependent, of course, a lot on astrophysics, because it's going to depend on the galactic properties that you, that you have for a specific, um, for like the mission of that line. But the population of each of those kind of uh, galaxies that um, with that properties depends on some cosmology. If you have some suppression at the small scales, you are not going to have some population of galaxies that is going to grow in the small halos, for example. So that's why by doing that, uh, we have the differences on the BID that we can that we are sensitive here, for example, for the cutoff on the. Um, on the on the power spectrum. This is the, the forecasted the energy on the cutoff for the power spectrum and the spectral index. Here is how it shows on the halo mass function, comparing it with lambda CDM. And also, um, <clears throat> basically, this you can translate it assuming some astrophysical model that you later marginalize over. Um, you can relate it to the luminosity function that is used to compute the, the BAD. Um, <clears throat> this is this is much less robust to to astrophysical contaminants.
Uh, no, actually, I mean, this uh, skewness of this distribution comes from um, the fact that like your map is not Gaussian and also that the mission is not Gaussian. So even if CIB is somewhat Gaussian in, um, or like you can somewhat predict their spectral shape, the distribution is the same of this, right? So like it's going mm -hmm. to be a big problem for this. For cosmology though, it has like the same information. So that's good, I guess, if you can model it properly. Uh, but CIB for the lines that observe in those uh, frequencies in the infrared, uh, it's a big problem. And basically the ways that the uh, people have to um, deal with it is try to separate the continuum from the lines by doing uh, some Fourier treatment of the of the signal. Then I don't know that much the details on how they separate the lines from the from the continuum. And then, uh, especially if you can cross correlate with some things or uh, etc., you can uh, also separate the correlated information somehow. But worst case scenario, you can clean this because it's going to be quite continuum, so it's going to be limited to the long uh, modes along the line of sight. So if you are okay with losing those modes. You can clean it. But I mean, the problem of the BAD is that since it's a one point statistic and it's not taking the differences and the correlations into points, you need to be much more careful with the contaminants and with the power spectrum. But we're working on it. But I think that the foregrounds are also like extremely non Gaussian. Yeah. I mean, the foregrounds are very non Gaussian too. Yeah. I don't know. We can talk about uh, it later because this is not only uh, like a function of frequency. I don't know which. I, I, we can talk about this later. I don't know exactly what you mean. Okay, sure. I mean, going to space is always great. <laughs> uh, we uh, remove all problems with the atmosphere that are a lot uh, for for many of these of these uh, frequencies. The problem is that is like much more expensive, and um, if something is wrong, that's it, right? Like we can't we can't solve it. So most of these experiments are actually from ground. I think uh, there are some balloons that are actually. Uh, very optimal for this because they are still cheap, but you remove most of the problems with the atmosphere. The problem is that it like the balloon crashes and that's it, right? Like you need to start from scratch. Um, so I think that the actually the only one that goes to a space, a space is a spherix. But it's important to know that a spherix is a galaxy survey. And then uh, by the way that they are observing, you can use it for an intensity mapping in the deep fields. Uh, but the Spherix has convinced and get the funding from NASA as a galaxy survey. And that's why they've been able to, to do all this. Then it's going to have like great secondary science for CIV or for intensity mapping on the, on the deep fields. But the main science driver and the ones that actually have got the money are those and also some solar system and planets that like I, I didn't know. Then SKA has a huge investment, if it happens in the end. Uh, uh, and Mirkat also, but like this, the part of the 21 centimeter survey with this is also a small part of, 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 this, of this funding. And most of these experiments are very cheap with order of like 20 people working on them. So this is like a very small community. Uh, so far we are growing. Uh, the teams are very small yet, but uh, some of the things that we've been talking in the last uh, years is basically having this uh, conversation with other communities, basically to develop experiments that can address more than one science case and get the funding that way. And not only one science case, but also different uh, ways of observing. Because for example, HEDEX, which is also one of the biggest experiments here, is also a galaxy survey, but they observe without targeting. And if there's no targeting, you can do intensity mapping too.
Yeah, uh, Spherix is full sky, but the way it um, it scans the sky, it does it, I think that it was like around the meridians. So each uh, orbit that it does around the celestial sky, it, uh, scanning always overlap on the on the collective poles. So that's why uh, you have this, where it is? Here, you have these deep fields in the poles of the eclectic uh, that actually almost overlap with uh, the deep fields of Euclid. So you can do a, a, a lot of things. And these, since are the deep fields and you have much better observations, you can actually do line intensity mapping with them. Then for the white field, you can only do a CIB science and like a things that don't need the good um, spectral resolution. The problem with Spherix though is that the spectral resolution is not great by default. So you are losing some information on the line of sight. Uh, it's the optical, but I can't tell you anymore now. Yeah, near infrared to the optical. Uh, yeah, for H alpha, yeah, but like I will need to translate this. <laughs> I don't remember it by heart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back to it. No, this is just like a proxy that we that we had. The basically, um, <clears throat> so this is from a simulation. This is the stellar mass of a galaxy or a halo, giving the of this mass, and we said like this is some normal or like ballpark number of what we can expect to observe from the with our mass and this red seed. But like this is, it could have been 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 9. It could have been the uh, water. <coughs> yeah, but, uh, <coughs> sorry. Basically here, the stars that you will be detecting are very <coughs> um, John stars that with like a very active star formation rate, that will be very, that will be very bright. Otherwise you don't observe them. Okay, thank you. Lo que estamos haciendo con el challenge es no ese calo, eh, pero eso es posterior. Sí, Paula, Silvia, sí, podéis oírme y de 6 a 12. Sí. Y ese calo, es decir, ese carry, ¿cuándo va a estar hecho? Eh, más o menos a la vez. Ah, a la vez. Sí, sí, sí. Es algo más que. Bueno, ese es el que está. Ese caldo creo que es la parte de Sudáfrica, porque te dice que es la parte de No, perdona, ese camil y ese caldo es la parte de Australia, que tiene un caldo de Iguí. Ah, vale. Pero. Y luego, cuando está completo, 
En principio con SK podría llegar hasta el tip 30, pero no sé si con la intensity no opino. No, sí, o sea, solo puedes llegar con el eh, ahí el problema va a ser cuánto conocemos de la atmósfera, qué tal con o sea, los por dónde van a ser distintos. Va a ser muy complicado, pero bueno. Eh, ¿podéis, ¿Podéis hablar vosotras a ver si se fluye en la sala, por favor? Hola, ¿se escucha? Ah, perfecto. Vale, ¿Se escucha a vosotros o no? no Hola, oído... ¿se me oye a mí? ¿O se me oye? No, no habéis oído las preguntas que ha hecho la gente, ¿no? No, yo he oído las respuestas, pero las preguntas no. Sí, vale, es que eh, estábamos usando el micrófono que tenía el, bueno, el ponente en su encuesta y no... Eh, pero bueno, por, por, la, la, por primera, respuesta, sí, la primera pregunta era sobre el efecto de los... O sea, el efecto que el cut-off en el power spectrum en las acciones y tal... Ah, bueno, hay momentos de estudio de tipo de cien arriba de negocios sobre Um, uh, the effect that it has on the BID, on the one-point statistic, and then uh, whether some of the 